This episode of the Third Sector podcast is sponsored by Ansvar. Ansvar protects more than 17,000 charities, big and small, across the UK. Their work with key organisations and charity bodies, as well as being owned by a charity themselves, means an unparalleled level of expertise across a wide range of topics, from governance to fundraising. Ask your insurance broker today for a quote for your charity. Hello and welcome to the Third Sector Podcast. I'm Lucinda Rouse. And I'm Emily Burt. Each week we bring you half an hour of discussion and debate about the important goings on in the charity world. And this week we'll be talking about language and how the different ways that it can be used can either encourage or possibly deter access to charitable services. And in Charity Changed My Life, we'll be hearing a powerful story about how one person turned his life around with the help of counselling and support from the charity One in Four. Yes, it's a good one. But first, we're going to dive straight into our main discussion, which is about language, a tool that we use every day in various forms and styles, both verbal and nonverbal. And choosing the right language to get your charity's message across in the most effective and impactful way is certainly a fine art, particularly when you consider the range of different audiences you might be appealing to, from donors to potential service users and a number of other stakeholders. And you've made a case in point, Lucinda, right there. As charities, how do you refer to the people who access your services? Are they your clients, your beneficiaries, your service users or something else altogether? And this is a constantly evolving conversation. At Third Sector, we currently use service user after the sector took a broad view that beneficiary was outdated and played into many of the paternalistic tropes that a lot of people in the sector are now trying to reject as part of their work. But then, of course, there are a lot of people who object to service user on the grounds that that is too clinical, too dispassionate. And I see conversations about this sort of language use all the time in our line of work. Yeah, it certainly can be a bit of a minefield on many levels, as Oxfam acknowledged last year when it published an inclusive language guide for people working in the sector as part of its commitment to tackle inequality and decolonise its way of working. But today I'm particularly keen to focus the discussion on how a charity's use of language can make its services as accessible as possible by communicating to potential users that it understands the issues they're facing and is well equipped to help. Absolutely. And we are delighted to have two guests with us in the studio with a wealth of experience in this area. So first up is Hattie Evans, Head of Brand and Marketing at Magic Breakfast, a charity which works to tackle morning hunger in schools across England and Scotland. Hi, Hattie. Hi, lovely to be here. Great to have you. Also with us is Georgie Howlett, Managing Director at Stand Agency and a specialist in behaviour change communications. Thank you so much for joining us, Georgie. And to get us started, could you give us your thoughts on how language can be both a barrier and an enabler to charity service accessibility? Of course, and thank you very much for having me. It's nice to be here and in person. So that I think there's a couple of things to acknowledge. I mean, for a start, like language is so loaded. It means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And if there's one kind of key outtake, for me, it's about doing the insight and don't work on assumption because you need to hear from the people that you're trying to talk to. And there's so much to be gained from doing that work. I think there are a couple of sort of challenges to surface or, or risks, if you like, that you want to overcome. One is that in trying to reach everyone, you end up reaching no one. So don't try to pick where you're going to have the the greatest impact another is that if you're too binary or kind of create too clear distinctions between all your different audiences you actually miss a much deeper opportunity for engagement and for community and the third is that you run this risk of stigmatizing those you're trying to help when talking about your cause to the wider public and that can be a really challenging one particularly when you're talking in media you know and, and the media wants to write about stories that are very compelling and strong and there's a fine line to tread there So a lot lot of risks to try and overcome. I think that word stigmatisation is really, really interesting. And I'd like to pick up on that. And and Hattie, I'd like Mm -hmm. to bring you in on it. So Magic Breakfast provides breakfasts to school children. I'd love to hear a little bit about what it is you do. And if you could talk to us about any barriers that you might have encountered when it comes to things like maybe parental reticence to making use of your provisions and how you've been able to sort of overcome any sensitivities and stigmatisations around your use of language when you're sort of 
figuring out how you really sell your services. Sure, absolutely. So Magic Breakfast exists to end morning hunger as a barrier to learning. We believe no child should be too hungry to learn. And it's such a simple solution, really, to a complex problem, which I think is the crux what I've tried to really bring when we think about communication, that complex issues don't always need complex answers. And in trying to break things down and be as clear as possible, that's how we can engage people to take action or engage with our services. But absolutely, that stigma, that is something we have to really battle with in providing food in schools. There can be hesitance around taking advantage of those services. And so we have an absolutely amazing group of engagement partners who work directly with our schools to help them engage children, teachers and the parents within those schools that this is not a free for those that need it message it's a free for all message and we are trying to not only feed children but show the benefit of feeding everyone there's a social element there and it impacts beyond those children that need it the most but the word free is actually quite an interesting Mm. challenge for us so what i said earlier around free to those that need it that actually in itself can think, oh, but do I need this? Or Mm. I'm worried about needing this, or I feel some anxiety around Mm. needing this. And so it's little nuances, like talking about universal breakfast. Why do we say universal school meals? That's a phrase we'll probably all recognize, Mm. right? And it's because it stops that you go first because you need it more, putting pressure on the child or putting pressure on the parent. So we're very careful with our use of language and then it is in with our engagement partners and how we set up all of these breakfasts with schools to make sure they're as accessible as possible. Mm. And Georgie mentioned at the beginning the sort of risks of trying to separate all of these different stakeholder groups too much in terms of how you communicate with them and the risk of not having a deep and meaningful connection with these people that you are interacting with. How do you communicate with the respective groups that you've mentioned, with the children, with the teachers, with the parents? Is it very different in your approach? Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things where one size does not fit all at all. And actually, some of the work we did with Stand and with Georgie was really looking into our audiences and insights around our audiences, because what actually appeals to a donor isn't going to be the thing that necessarily is going to lead a teacher or a parent to take action. And there is this idea around proximity to the issue. And the closer you are to the issue, different messages actually will make you take action or partake in a charity. The further you get away from an issue, perhaps you need a bit more to take action or you need a bit more alliterative stories. So, for example, just some of the work we did was around what connects most with teachers is actually stories around food insecurity because they're there every day they see it they are bringing food into schools because they know that there may be kids in their class going hungry for parents we found it's around child poverty and for donors it was around attainment so kids actually you know having breakfast leads to better grades in the long term so we really have to think about how we shift our messaging up depending on those audiences Mm. That's so interesting. And so it's really good to know that you two have worked on this together. Georgie, I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts on, you know, we've heard a bit there about how you tailor your messaging Mm -hmm. to suit different groups. But are there any challenges or possible pitfalls that comes from trying to appeal in that way to those multiple audiences in different ways when talking about your mission and your purpose? Because I know that you obviously said there don't make it for everyone. Mm -hmm. What are the potential risks in tailoring those messages? First off, you know, as communicators, we often, in our messaging strategy, we go, okay, there's obviously a value in separating out different messages to different audiences. We've explained there are different motivators. And because there are so many different channels and touch points now, it does mean that you can do that cleverly. I think the risks are that if you then lump those people into very specific groups, you'll only ever think of them that way. So like if you're asking somebody, just donate £10 and that's all we're asking, that's all you'll ever get. And you won't then get necessarily an opportunity to then build more of a community or a movement around something, which is, I think, a real opportunity for the charity sector. 
the idea that somebody's donating. They're donating probably because they have some other sort of like personal or emotional reason for getting involved. And similarly, like on the flip side, people who are traditionally service users or beneficiaries or whatever word your charity uses, they often have a lot more to give and want to give than just receiving what you're offering. So I think Parkinson's UK does some great work in the space where they bring people together and they have created like a kind of a panel of people who have Parkinson's and also have a say in kind of like how the charity works and where they're focusing. So I'm aware this is sort of veering out of language, but it's sort of a potential repercussion of how language can end up creating silos that you don't necessarily want. I think there's something that Hattie was talking about that's really interesting in terms of, you know, what's going to create that connection with people like what might encourage them to use your services and I think somebody asked a question around the, you know what are the potential barriers to people accessing your services and you're saying sometimes it's people think oh well, I'm not I don't need it enough there are other people who might think need things more than me that's a really common challenge is that people won't self-qualify if you like and so there's a real job for language to do whether that's asking questions like do you experience this we're here for you. Are you facing these challenges? We're here for you. Really kind of speaking directly to the person, using second person, using the language of you. But also there's some really clever ways around it too. I don't know if you've come across Eva Peel and they've got a podcast called Probably Nothing because that was one of the Mm. biggest barriers of women sort of seeking help around gynecological health is they would go, it's probably nothing. But And so creating a whole kind of like stream to their communications that was around that barrier it brings it to the surface and it means that it almost turns that barrier into an opportunity where people go oh well all those other people have sought help so maybe I should so maybe I'll maybe I'll seek their services or I'll ask a doctor and I think that's very powerful so again that comes back to understanding your audiences being clear on their barriers and they go how can we use language to either call that out directly or to kind of overcome it as a hurdle Absolutely. And I think even just the language that we've used in the context of this conversation, you think donor and your brain immediately goes to financial donation, Mm -hmm. right? You think donor and it's money. In fact, you know, most people, the vast majority of people who contribute to charity, it's not just that they're putting their hands in their pockets. Many donate time Mm -hmm. by volunteering. Absolutely. You know, and that's a part of community. Exactly. A community. And so, you know, moving away from these kind of hard and fast ideas about mm. those groups actually then creates a much more nuanced view mm. yeah. of your community. Yeah. And as you say, it empowers the charity to make the most use mm. of that community that it belongs to and the community it serves. I really like to think of audiences in a cycle so that generally they're all supporters, so oh. that a donor could be a campaigner, could be a service user. And those roles are actually quite interchangeable sometimes. We don't necessarily always need to think of our service users as just those who are benefiting from a service. It's a transaction where actually they care deeply about the topic. They could be an absolute advocate for the topic. So how do we make them feel part of the organisation, not just being served by it. You're here to receive, Mm. you know, super condescending. Yeah. 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 And that comes back to the power of simple language. So when you were talking at the beginning about beneficiaries or service Mm. users, I think if you say we're here to help people or like just remove all of that jargon altogether and talk about, you know, the community we serve or we exist to support people with. And I think just getting rid of that language as much as possible has huge power. It's also something about thinking about your mission. Yeah. So why are you here as a charity? And if you think more about that rather than necessarily what you do, people can then align to this Mm. future sense. So I always think for Magic Breakfast, it's that no child should be too hungry to learn. That's kind of the core of our future vision of what we would want. And I mean, most people would agree with that, right? And then they can partake in different ways to help achieve that to happen. Don't overcomplicate. Exactly. Very much so. (laughs) So you've mentioned a, a couple of examples there, Parkinson's and Eve. Eve Appeal. Eve yeah. Appeal, yeah. Any others that spring to mind of examples of charities that have done a really good job at stripping away jargon mm-hmm. or excess complexity that perhaps acts as a barrier yeah. to accessing services? We did some work a little while ago with Tommy's and I think they do a brilliant job of talking to people who are very different mental states if you like so that you could be talking to somebody who's experiencing a perfectly healthy pregnancy and they're saying hey we're here if you just want a bit of advice if you're feeling a bit anxious we can support you equally they're talking at the opposite end of the spectrum where people are experiencing extreme loss 
you know, so that's a really hard tone to get right. And I think they're, they're always learning and they're always iterating. There was a piece of work that we did with them to reach a new audience. They hadn't ever done anything to reach dads and partners. And they'd done some research that showed that dads and partners kind of wanted somewhere to go as well. And I guess a lot of the learnings from what they'd done so far came to the fore. And we did a lot of language that was very direct. You know, it was stuff around, we see you, or you don't always need to be the strong one. Not just the language being simpler, but also then we surface the lived experience a lot more. So who the language is coming from matters just as much. And I think they're very good at doing that. The, the campaign that we ran to reach dads and partners had case studies, for want of a better word, individuals who had had some support from Tommy's looking either directly at camera, speaking directly to camera, speaking directly to another dad or partner and saying, I've been where you are. Tommy's is here to help. And the power of that, that power of that very directional, clear me, us, you, we, it seems so simple. And yet it's amazing how you can see many charities then don't do that. But yeah, I think that's that's one good example that comes to mind. And Hattie, at Magic Breakfast, I understand that you have also been making sure that you're involving people with lived experience in your communications. Is that correct? Yes, yes, absolutely. So we do that in a number of different ways, but a lot of what we strive to do is really centre the experience of young children and young people and their families in how we communicate. So it's this is not about you, this is with you. And I think that is something that a lot of charities struggle with, with trying to convey a story from a community without necessarily being able to access that community to making sure you're saying it right, really as <laughs> simple as that. And we did some research last year, actually, which was really, we were so pleased for that. It's called um, What's for Breakfast. It was a full report into the experiences of parents and families and their children. We did it with four and a half thousand children and four and a half thousand parents. And I thought that was really interesting because sometimes within research and insight within charity, we can get so bogged down in accuracy, being correct in our numerics that sometimes we forget it's about people mm. <laughs> and we have to be interacting with those individuals in order to represent them in numbers. And so this report was centering children and young people and their parents and the whole although yes, grounded in quantitative data, and that is important, but it was qualitative stories all the way through that spoke to those numbers and why that existed, which was fantastic. And I just, you know, we, we were so proud of it. And that has really bred, I think, a great view within the charity of trying to do that as much as possible. Mm. We are at the moment, you know, thinking about, you know, what panels can we develop more? Um, how can we engage with teachers more? Our, you know, engagement partners who I mentioned earlier, our staff members. So we we have individuals who go into schools to make that connection with schools. It's not done digitally. It's not done via email. Well, of course, those tools are used as well. But it's really vital to have that person-to-person -person relationship to help foster those stories and engage with people. So, yeah, we use lots of different ways to do that. But... I think it's really interesting thinking about data and research within these topics because mm. it's really important for charities to be accurate, but thinking about enablers and barriers, right? How much of the time does a big stat for us, for example, is 4 million children are in food insecure homes. What does that mean? 4 million children are at risk of hunger. Mm. What does that mean? And it's actually, if you put it into, that's one in four children might not have breakfast this morning. Mm. It's much more impactful when you actually put it to the experience of that child. Mm. I think we can use lots of different nuance in that way. There's an interesting tension point, isn't there, that often exists. I've certainly seen it sort of being on the outside of charities and often helping lots of charities with it. When you're working with language, you touched at the very mm. beginning on the complexity. A lot of problems that charities exist to help with are highly complex mm. and the people working on the coalface of like making it all happen are sort of so embedded in that complexity that sometimes when you're working on the language side of things and you're trying to kind of turn it into something simple and straightforward there can be resistance even in turning to be like well that's oversimplifying it like that does that really do it justice it's a real process to go through and this is more of a internal observation but when 
I've gone through this process with with charities in the past. There's such a key role to be played out in co-creating and bringing other people on the journey so they understand why you've made certain decisions. And again, the reason we did the insight with Magic Breakfast is not just to help us kind of better understand those audiences. It's also then to be able to say, we've listened and this is what we've heard and therefore that explains our decisions. And that's why we're using the simpler language because if we don't, we're falling at a first hurdle because we're then not going to reach people properly. I think something that is so interesting that both of you have touched on in different ways now is there is actually a really big historic trend of charities really falling down in this area. A lot of the time they have run so many amazing and very effective communication campaigns over the years. But a lot of the time, historically, this does come at the expense of the very people that they are trying to support. As you were saying, it's about you, not with you. And a lot of the the kind of campaigns, the language that's been used, has been described as you know dehumanizing you know Mm -hmm. disempowering Mm -hmm. and it's playing on that in order to elicit an emotional response from a potential supporter but that is incredibly problematic as we know so I wonder if, if both of you would be able to kind of give some sort of practical advice We've talked about like the importance of mm-hmm. that lived experience piece in communicating, but how you gather that and how you sort of make sure really on a practical level that you are avoiding stigmatization, that you are avoiding perpetuating problems in how the people that you work with are portrayed to the wider world. Well, it's a big question, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing to do is thinking about traumatic storytelling. So what I mentioned earlier around proximity to the issue and almost the further you get away from an issue as a person, almost you want to know that story. You want to know, oh yeah, this is terrible. You know, for us, for example, that one in four children are you know, at risk of going hungry or that parents are skipping meals in order to feed their children. You know, that is a broader issue within communities. What stories are we trying to tell? How are we representing those people? We have to make really difficult decisions around, do we say people's names? Do we have people on camera talking about this? Do they understand the ramifications that that could include? So really think about why you're telling someone's story. What's going to be the impact of that story on your chosen audience? But what is the impact of that story on the person who's telling it? So we anonymize most of the time, or we say parent, or we say year four child, as much as possible, just that we're not focusing on trauma as a kind of glossy, you know, come and pay attention to us piece. I also just would think about a bit what we mentioned earlier, thinking about the words you were using and what they might mean to different people. So in the research we did together, the word shame, for example, I feel ashamed about needing this service or I feel anxious about it, really struck a chord with donors, for example. They were like, oh my goodness, yes, I understand that. But actually with parents, that felt really isolating, that didn't work. And words like pride or being proud felt better they felt a bit more connected to that so talk to the people that you're telling the story about because you know it's such a useful tool to make sure that you're not falling into these pitfalls all the time or making assumptions about people and their experience Mm -hmm. yeah those would be my my I think yeah and every charity is different as well like you said the importance of engaging with the communities you'll know where their line is and what they're happy with yeah and you'll know if there are people and individuals who are happy to speak out and to talk I think I was trying to think about other sort of similarities because obviously this, the one that we encountered mm. about shame and stigmatization and people therefore then feeling embarrassed to access a service is definitely a barrier. It's something that we've seen. It's been widely documented and researched around food banks having a similar issue and that people need them, but then aren't using them because they don't want to be a food bank user. Mm. So if you look at another space that's worked pretty hard, I think, to kind of overcome this over the last many years is mental health. There are a lot of people who perhaps wouldn't seek help because they wouldn't want to sort of feel that stigma of reaching out and asking for help. And then look at all the language that's been used around that. It's okay not to be okay. I think Mind uses language around if you're going through a tough time, you're not alone. They service a lived experience. So like, you know, they've got a quote from a, a real person who's used their services saying, it may seem like a small gesture, but the difference it makes to a person like me is huge. 
it's very humanizing it's very equalizing it's very kind of like straight talking so I think there is a duty that a charity has to be able to kind of like tell a story but it has to be authentic there was a a study that's come out really recently I think it was by the University of Nottingham and it was showing how the power of story and real narratives helped other people who had mental health challenges it actually improved their quality of life reading other people's recovery stories Mm. because it gave them a sense of hope made them feel less alone and it was an actual genuine statistical uplift in their experience so there's a real power to be had there a a genuine like life-changing power of sharing stories but what was really key in this research is they said they didn't change a thing about the story they didn't try to edit it or tweak bits it was sort of verbatim whether that was kind of a video story or or written story whatever it was so I think there's also the power of, of authenticity and genuine voices and using lived experiences in a kind of respectful way Mm. when you were talking about like overall like in practical steps another thing to be really mindful of is the power of obviously I come at this from like behavior change sort of expertise the power of social norming is often used to kind of like get more people to do something so the challenge that charities face when they're saying this problem is on the rise if it's a behavioral one you're basically social norming the behavior so you're that you've then got this challenge if 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 that thing is increasing then more people are going to do it so there might then be ways to kind of use that on its you know flipping it on its head so food banks can say like more people are having to use our services than ever then people might feel less alone in the fact that they do so we have seen stories like that so how can you use behavior change sort of like social norming tools to kind of make people feel less alone and remove the stigma altogether so it feels very perfectly acceptable in in individuals own minds to seek help Super interesting, all of that. And I have a slightly different question, Hattie, just to understand where you're coming from at Magic Breakfast. You mentioned parents who might seek to self-disqualify because they think, oh, why do I need a free breakfast for my child? And you've got around that by saying breakfast for all. Are there any other barriers that you come up against in, in getting people to buy into the idea of of what Magic Breakfast is doing? Well, yeah, I mean, twofold, really. There might just be, for us, just even language barriers and encouraging families in different cultures to come along and engage with the services. But there also is, you know, I think quite an unhelpful rhetoric generally, which I'm sure lots of charities have, of why do parents need this? You know, Mm. why can't parents, you know, feed their own children? And that in itself can act to discourage parents from actually seeking the help that is on offer to them. That is such a complex issue, but it's such a loaded issue. And it is something that we we battle with, you know, definitely within commentary in various guises. I think it's interesting in society when it's not just personal experience that might stop someone from engaging with a service and getting help. It's also societal judgment. Mm -hmm. And so it's we'd spend a lot of time trying to really disqualify that narrative as well. So think really kind of putting emphasis into research, into influencing policy and government as much as possible as well, that this is a much broader solution that will help everyone. It's not just about an individual making a choice because of cost of living crisis, because of job insecurity. There's tons of reasons why a parent might struggle to feed their child. You've given us so much food for thought in this half hour, so thank you so much for that. One final question then, just to conclude on, which is having taken away all of your brilliant insights, if you have charities out there who are thinking about, like, what are the most effective ways that I can now really start practically deploying the language that I use? Do you have any final practical tips for those organisations? Okay, um, no jargon. It's an obvious one. Passive language, avoiding passive language and going for active language instead. That might mean you, we, I. It's also making sure that wherever you have the opportunity to, that you lead with a question, that you're engaging people in that way. There's also a very clever study that's been done by Professor Christopher Bryan, where he looked at the difference between asking people to go and vote versus saying, be a voter. And that shift in just one letter difference Mm. means it's linking it to identity. And identity is a very powerful tool when you're trying to 
persuade people or invite people to do something if you're shifting mindsets or changing behaviors if you can link into people's identity that's really really powerful and so that is a really good example because it showed a difference in kind of participation similarly we talked about the value of insight start with that insight and don't make assumptions so that you understand your audiences and, and test language don't just do an insight as an isolated project by itself if you can get a panel of people that you can continually test with it's what we had with Tommy's when we were doing some of that work. You'll never please everyone, so let go of that <laughs> because otherwise you'll tie yourself up in knots and centering the voice of the people you exist for. So wherever you can, it's not just the language, it's who it's coming from. Amazing. Um, from my side, it would be really focusing on the basics and getting the basics right. What I said earlier around complex issues don't always necessarily need complex answers. We've got to remember that the national reading age in the UK is nine. You know, the Sun newspaper writes for a reading age of eight, the Guardian age of 14. We're not in a society where really complex language is necessarily necessary. And so really think about how you would describe the challenge or the issue of your charity to a friend, to your neighbour, to your grandma, and write as you would speak it's really little things, but short sentences, not going on for reams and reams and connecting language, really keeping things punchy and short, breaking up your pages with bullets is how people actually engage information, especially nowadays online and quick reading. We have such a short amount of time to engage with people. People skim stuff. So really thinking about that and generally the simplest way of communicating is probably the best. So give it a go. We don't need to worry too much about oversimplification because, as we said at the, at the very beginning, different audiences need different things. So if you're talking to an MP, yes, they might need something specific. Or you're talking to a donor, they might need something specific. But your general overview should be as simple as possible so that most of your audiences can take something away from it. Brilliant. Well, Hattie from Magic Breakfast and Georgie from Stand, thank you both so much for joining us. Thanks thank for having you. us. Thank you. It's been lovely. Thank you. Now we move on to Charity Changed My Life, in which we bring you the stories of people whose lives have been transformed for the better, thanks to the work of charities. I would like to provide a quick content warning before we listen this week, though because this week we are hearing from a service user of One in Four, a charity that provides counselling support to survivors of child sexual abuse, violence and trauma. Their account is very open and honest, but some people may find it distressing to listen. And if you would prefer, you can skip about three minutes ahead if you would really like to listen to the ending credits of the podcast. I am a survivor. I have been abused and... My childhood was really bad uh, from the aspect that I was bullied, I was assaulted at home. I got to a point where I was really struggling to cope with my past childhood abuse. I felt unsafe in myself and it was affecting just, just my everyday life. So I did a Google and I found one of four and they actually contacted me within a week and within two weeks I was actually able to see a therapist and I think that's just amazing. I meet at six o'clock every week on a Monday. My therapist Fiona, she's been brilliant in helping me to uh, express my feelings so even if it happened 20 years ago you've still got those feelings in your head. I felt ashamed of these feelings in, in myself. I felt ashamed that I have experienced this sort of thing in my life, but I don't feel that anymore. I feel that I'm, I'm a lot stronger in myself. I feel more confident in myself and I can go out there and like today, I'm sharing my story with you and I can have done that a year ago. I cannot have said to you right now that I've experienced child sexual abuse. It makes me feel empowered. It makes me feel safe. It makes me feel, if I have a trigger in life, that I can sit down and think about it. I was uh, losing my jobs quite a lot because of my mental health. But 
I've been with my current job in Tesco for the last year since being with my therapist and that in itself I feel is an achievement. It's little things that that I'm able to do now. I'm able to look at the world differently as well. So I can see that there are some bad people in life, but not everyone's bad. I'm able to open up to someone, uh, my therapist, and from day one, she's been non-judgmental. She's been open and honest. It's the fact I'm listened to, I'm heard, and that, that's, that's really important in itself. That was a story of someone whose life has been turned around in the space of just a year through the therapy provided by One in Four. If you've been affected by any of the issues covered in his story, then you can visit oneinfour.org.uk for support and signposting to additional services. And if you would like your organisation to be featured in Charity Change My Life, we'd love to hear from you. All it takes is a short voice message from someone who has benefited from your services. You can find details of how to get in touch in the show notes to this episode. And that's it for this week. Next week, we'll be talking about toxic cultures, how to avoid having one in your workplace and how to get rid of it if you do. But before that episode lands, there are two important dates to keep in mind. The Third Sector Tech Summit takes place on the 7th of February with a packed agenda covering everything from artificial intelligence to digital transformation on a shoestring. And the 8th of February is the deadline for the Business Charity Awards for businesses that want to shout about their amazing charity partnerships. Both of those dates are coming up soon, so don't wait to file your entry or book your place. But for now, thank you very much to our guests Georgie and Hattie and our producer Navpal.